Hello, I'm Marcia Capita. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, politically at least, Angola warden Burl Kane may be a dead man walking as some of his business deals are being investigated. Kane's resignation comes at a time when the new governor is preparing his administration. We'll look at the plans to date and also what was learned when political strategists did their own post-mortem of the gubernatorial campaign. We'll also examine problems with the programs for disadvantaged businesses, and in this season of peace and goodwill, we will look at an emotionally charged issue over monuments that was touched off by City Hall. Also a part of the holiday season is bowl games. We'll examine how New Orleans fared in the business side of landing its two events. Starting for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. Gordon Russell, managing editor for Investigations, the New Orleans Advocate. Jessica Williams, reporter, the New Orleans Advocate. And Stephanie Grace, reporter the New Orleans Advocate. Okay, first we're going to go over to Gordon and in the headlines this week, the retirement slash resignation of the warden at Angola, Burl Kane, and this is following some articles that you all had done about some business dealings he was involved in. Yeah, it was kind of a surprise, abrupt uh, retirement announced uh, this week and it kind of, it followed uh, an article, with several articles, but one main article we did about uh, some uh, real estate deals that he had in West Feliciana Parish where um, he had gotten uh, some investors who were, one of them was the stepfather of an inmate at Angola and one of them was, uh, was a person who was very close to an inmate in, in Angola who he was trying to get um, released. And uh, the state has rules about what kind of interactions wardens and other Department of Corrections employees, what kind of relationships they should have with inmates and their families and their close friends. And this seems to go outside that. Um, this was, uh, these deals <laughs> happened several years ago and, and hadn't become public until our stories. And so we wrote about this and raised questions about it. And. Uh, we were in the process of raising some more questions, uh, writing some more stories about some of his earlier controversial business dealings. And then uh, when we were preparing um, that last story, he um, he abruptly resigned after 21 years on the job. 21 years. Yeah. So um, but he was really credited, though, with sort of improving things at the state prison. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a matter of debate. I mean, mostly I would say that's true. Um, I think there are people who think he takes more credit than he deserves, mm -hmm. certainly, um, and that a lot of, once upon a time, Angola was a notoriously bloody prison, and it came under a federal consent decree in the 70s. Um, there was a judge overseeing improvements to it, and it improved steadily over time. Um, to the point that by the time uh, Warden Kane took over, it was uh, almost ready to come out of this consent decree, mm -hmm. and it was released from the consent decree in 1998. He took, I believe, it was 98. He took he took over in 95. I think some of his predecessors feel like he takes credit for all of it when actually a lot of the hard work uh, happened before he got there. He's really been on the speaker circuit all those years, though. Yeah, very kind of popular speaker, very charismatic, talk obviously. About rehabilitation very, and bring religion very folksy. into it. folksy. He's very religious, right. and he, he, he's built uh, eight chapels, I believe yeah. it is, at Angola, and he's, um, he's very open about his Christianity and his, his belief that anyone can be redeemed no matter what they've done. And it's a lot of people who never get out, too, which right. is interesting. So. And he's undeniably done a lot of things that the inmates have appreciated. I mean, one thing that comes to mind is the way that inmates, the, the, the way that they're buried when they're there. There's, there's, a, there's a funeral now, uh, um, and there's, they're actually buried in a wooden box. They used to be buried in a cardboard box. He, he oh, often wow. tells a story about a funeral that took place shortly after he got there where the cardboard box uh, broke, you know, oh. fell open, the bottom fell out while they were trying to bury mm -hmm. an inmate and it was just very sort of undignified and didn't seem like a befitting way to send somebody off. And so he's tried to, I think, do some things that give the inmates a little more hope and a little more dignity. So he stepped away, he stepped down, he's retired um, or resigned, however you want to look at it. But what yes. has been his response though? Have, have you guys been able to talk to him, get any comments he from him? He has declined, you know, he's a, fam he's a guy who loves to talk to the media and he has uh, refused over and over <laughs> to talk to us when we've told him what we're looking into. He, he keeps telling us we've got him all wrong but he is also not 
uh, made any effort to rebut anything that we've reported. Um, Didn't he say that he did he resign when he got some questions from you? Was yeah, he said that part of the reason he decided to resign this week was because we, we had sent him a long list of questions uh, related to some of the reports we're still working on, and he, he said that he knew it was time to go. He also insinuated that we had we had uh, faulted his his religiosity which uh, is not the case, but um, anyway. So you said, that he, yeah, the way you put it, he, he seems to have stepped outside of some of the rules. And was this illegal, what he's done? So not on its face, certainly not. Uh, uh, it's possible that it was if, if, he, if the, his investors paid more than the property was worth or something like that. And we don't have any evidence that that's the case. Um, as far as we know, this was just something that violated rules that Department of Corrections employees are supposed to abide by. So the next warden at Angola? Uh, well, there's an interim warden now, Daryl Vanoy, who's somebody who's worked. He's an assistant warden. I think he's been the warden at uh, Dixon Correctional Institute most recently, and he's been in Angola before. He's a longtime de Department of Corrections employee, and he's an interim warden. I don't know if he'll be kept on permanently and or Kane not. And leaves January 1st, right? That's, the start that's of the what new he year. said, yeah. Okay, Gordon, thanks a lot. I'm going to go over to Jessica now, and there's a very emotional issue in the region over certain monuments that the mayor wants to see taken down, declared as public nuisance. There was a pretty raucous meeting yesterday at City Council Chambers. There was, and I think at that meeting you saw a lot of the emotions come out, and you saw a lot of the feeling that people have had in the city for a while and have just kind of maybe attached it a little bit to the monuments. I mean, people were sort of using the monuments as a way to decry other folks in the city who they felt were too politically correct or, you know, too quick to get offended. And there were other people who kind of said, well, if you want the monuments to stay up, then it automatically means, must mean that you support slavery or that were racist, and it kind of really devolved into this discussion of personal attacks. And I believe two people had to be ejected um, mm -hmm. by New Orleans police, and you know, just really um, indicative of the really raw emotions around this issue. So, how did we get here? I think we got here um, really just because of a national discussion um, that evolved um, really over the summer. Um, you had a bunch of uh, mayors around the country sort of calling um, for removal of Confederate symbols. Um, just in the wake of just some really, I um, believe it was an incident that occurred, um, and, and a bunch of mayors had said that they were just not um, going to tolerate um, any sort of, uh, you know, just racial, mm -hmm. um, just any sort of racial injustice in any way. And, and in some way, that was going to be um, realized if we leave these monuments up, or we, if we leave these monuments up in some way, we're supportive of, you know, racial injustice. And, and that was one of the things that Landrew had proposed um, in the summer when he came out with his plan. And of course, the monuments we're talking about is the, the Robert E. Lee Monument at Lee Circle, uh, PGT Beauregard in front of City Park, Jefferson Davis, which is on Jefferson Davis Parkway, and then the Liberty Monument, which is sort of tucked away near Canal Place. Um, at first, when this first came out from the mayor, we did see some support there among was council some support. members, but that's changed. There was some support among council members. I think particularly you saw Latoya Cantrell um, sort of rise up in support for the removal of the monuments, even ahead, I believe, of the mayor's announcement. Um, and then certainly now, she has been one of the more outspoken council members against the mayor and just has sort of described this as a top-down uh, solution or a top-down decision that wasn't reached without uh, input from the broader community, which is interesting because because she was one of the ones that had called for this mm -hmm. initially, and mm -hmm. now she's sort of taken a, a, a reversal of that stance. Well, I think that what was baffling to a lot of people, though, is that there was really no upheaval about this. This wasn't an issue that people were talking about um, at all, and there'd been a whole series since the 70s. There had been a succession of black mayors of New Orleans that never really came up as, as an issue with them, at least not to a major point with them. There have been it, some fights over that Liberty Place monument yeah. in the past, but no. Which has been, yeah, the Liberty yeah, Place monument moved. has been, it was moved and replaced, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> with a little yeah, yeah, the Liberty Place monument, if a monument can be punished, it's already been punished. Yes. It, was, it was moved from Canal Street. Yeah. Um, no, and so all of a sudden this issue just came up, yeah. and especially in the year, um, you know, the year, the 10th anniversary of Katrina, a year yeah. which, as I looked at coming into the year, I was hoping it would be like a really feel-good year of people standing together and remembering what they went through with Katrina and, and looking ahead to the future, and then this all of a sudden came and, and stirred things up. Well, there's a it, segment out there in the community, um, where they say they've gotten 31,000 um, signatures on a petition to, to save the monuments, the monuments and their yes. Save Our Circle and 
the Monuments to Monumental Task Force or Monuments Task Force or, or people who want to save the monuments, and we heard them make their case yesterday. Now, Errol, you wanted to also touch on this process. As you, you said, it, yeah. sort of, it came down from City Hall. We've been in a situation where there's been more of a process before. Yeah. One thing I want to point out, there's also kind of like loose history in these things. You know, like there was this lady, uh, um, you know, who said all these people were racist and they were for slavery. Robert E. Lee was strongly against slavery. And there's many writings, I mean, you can see his history, that he was, uh, he wasn't fighting for slavery, he was fighting for Virginia, which is uh, his father had been governor of and his family had been. And back in those days, your state was seen as being more important than your nation. And that changed with the Civil War, the, the, right. that the nation became more important. But anyway, I was just trying to think back to a incidents where there was some kind of question that went to City Hall. Sometimes City Hall was the center of it. And how it was um, resolved that, that had like a, a racial tones to it. And, and probably the most famous was in 1992, and that was Dorothy Mae Taylor's ordinance on, on, on Carnival. And full disclosure here, I mean, they, um, they, they quickly established, I thought this was commendable in the city's part, uh, as raucous as, as, as this was, they quickly established a Blue Ribbon Committee. And the Blue Ribbon Committee met for several months behind the scenes, and uh, I was asked to be on that, on that committee. And the committee members were both black and white, and they got along famously. I mean, I mean, and, uh, and, and they all had the same objective. Let's find a resolution, but this as quickly as possible, so we can get back to uh, uh, our lives. But, but, but they really worked well behind the scenes. Uh, Sidney Bartholomew was a mayor at, at the time, and Sidney Bartholomew, who, who publicly just took a, a, a beating because of this, even though it was Dorothy May Taylor's ordinance, he worked diligently behind the scenes too, and I think he, uh, he never got the, uh, the, the appreciation uh, he deserves. And so so, but the council meetings is where the nasty things happen. I mean, that's where things get raucous and where people say, and they use the same language you heard yesterday, talking about slaves and chains and all, yeah, and, and you have all to that sort of thing. acknowledge that the, you know, the flip side of Robert E. Lee being maybe anti-slavery is he was put in that, on that pedestal by people who wanted to commemorate the Civil War and the Confederacy. So, well, you know, right now, I'm going to have to jump in here. But right now, the council is going to be voting on it in the next council meeting coming up this week, December um, 17th. Yeah. Which, of course, they could defer a vote. I mean, do they do we know if they have enough votes to actually move ahead with this nuisance ordinance? I haven't heard that they do or that they don't, and we're still mm -hmm. kind of waiting to find out what is going to be the outcome. I mean. Yeah. Obviously, there's clear support for the monuments remaining up, just as there's clear opposition right. for them remaining. I mean, I wonder if at this point there could even be some sort of a compromise that could be inked where you know well, there, you leave a, few, a few and you it to a vote of the right. people uh, of the right. public. So, okay, well, we'll be seeing. We have to move on right now. I'm going to go over to Stephanie, and our governor-elect is yes. starting to put together his people. He is. Um, the governor-elect and his team, they're holed up on the top floor of a dorm at LSU. They're, I was up there yesterday, they're ming, you know, politicians mingling with students, everyone kind of going about their business. And, um, you know, he started to make some, there's a lot of, there are a lot of meetings going on. He started to make some announcements. The biggest one was not a surprise to anyone, I think, that former lieutenant governor, or current outgoing lieutenant mm -hmm. governor, Jay Darden, Republican, who was one of his opponents in the gubernatorial race, is going to come on board as commissioner of administration. And that's the job where, that's the guy in charge of the budget, and who, you know, who's going to be tasked with coming up with a way to really tackle some of the structural budget issues that, um, you know, have been plaguing Louisiana that people really feel like have to be dealt with to get us out of this cycle of, um, you know, having to scotch tape together a budget mm -hmm. every year. Uh, Jay Darden is somebody who obviously broke party lines and endorsed John Bell Edwards in the primary. They developed a really good relationship while they were kind of traveling the, you know, the debate circuit mm -hmm. around um, both around during the governor's race and both kind of uh, did not like the way David Vitter was handling things. Um, one thing to know about Jay Darden is he used to be in the state Senate and he was the finance chair back when Mike Foster was governor. So he really has a lot of experience with the budget specifically. He was also mm -hmm. Secretary of State for a while. And he was Secretary yeah. of State. So and and he, Lieutenant Governor, there's probably not a man alive. Sure. Has, 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 has he could be so the best qualified ever. Now, you know, there are people branch, who yeah. say, you know, what they say, they adamantly say that there was no deal cut when this endorsement happened. You know, it's not a cushy job, I will say that. I mean, I think there are other jobs he could have gotten that would have been more fun. <laughs> but, you know, he's a well-respected public servant, has been for really many years, and 
it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things he does have is relationships with the legislature and relationships with Republicans, because of course John Bell Edwards is a Democrat who will be dealing with a Republican legislature. Um, another thing to watch on that front, there's kind of a fight developing to be Speaker of the House in the legislature. John Bell Edwards has endorsed Walt Leger, who's a New Orleans Democrat, very popular among his colleagues, very well regarded, the current Speaker pro tem, which is the number two person. Um, and But there is a group of Republicans who basically say, we have the majority, there should be a Republican mm -hmm. Speaker of the House. And their candidate is Cameron Henry, who is a representative from Metairie. He supported Vitter in the election. Um, he's actually the protege of Steve Scalise, who is, you know, used to be in the legislature, now is in Congress, and is very much a kind of Republican Party builder. So this is really seen as, I think, a, a bellwether to are we going to kind of continue to have something of a nonpartisan legislature, or are we going to become maybe more like Washington and have more distinct political parties? Um, you know, Louisiana is really an outlier in that sense, and I think you know, it, on the one hand, the governor has a lot of power because he can kind of install his people, but on the other hand, you know, we don't have the real gridlock that we have in Washington and in other state legislatures. So I think you know how this works the, out. The, kind of the answer to that question is is no. Um, <laughs> we're not going to become like Washington because the reason the parties are able to develop distinctly in Washington mm -hmm. is because they nominate candidates for president. I mean, mm -hmm. that's their main response. I mean, that's really what kind of keeps them together. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, it doesn't right. work that way on the state well, level. Well, and the other thing is, the in, in Congress, they're organized by party. You know, there's no question if you have a Republican majority mm -hmm. in Congress that you'll have a Republican Speaker of the House. Here, there is a question, which is very interesting. And because of the governor's involvement. Because of the this. governor's involvement. And, you know, we even if we have a Democratic Speaker of the House, we will certainly have a lot of Republican party chairs. So that's just a very different dynamic as well. The okay. question about the... Um, Dorden leading a job that's not going to be as much fun. The job he has now is the fun job. It is. That's, that's tourism. Being lieutenant governor. Yes. Lieutenant <laughs> right. governor, you go to all the parties for yeah. uh, He's for some tourism. Chief promoter or some serious, yeah. serious challenges before them all. Exactly. Right now. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Sure. I'm going to go over to Je Jessica right now. Another big issue um, before council was regarding disadvantaged businesses, and there has been some controversy regarding that. They've come up with some new rules. Can you explain them? Sure. They've come up with some new rules. Um, the important piece to remember um, is there's two separate things. One is a local hiring ordinance, which essentially tries to get more uh, Orleans Parish residents hired on city construction projects. And the other is a disadvantaged business enterprise uh, policy, which essentially firms up rules that the council established two years ago. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the DBE policy is that they've actually instituted um, a ban on DBE uh, subcontractors who then in turn subcontract their work to non-DBE firms. Mm -hmm. And this was an issue that came about in a story that we did um, last month and we've continued to report on it since in which you had a DBE um, Nomar core um, basically subcontract its, its contract values on the Iberville housing redevelopment to firms that were not certified as DBEs. Um, and usually when a firm does something like that, there's all these accusations of whether the firm was just set up, you know, in order to get the contract because you have to have a certain percentage of participation. For the main contractor. For the main contractor. Mm -hmm. The main contractor has to hire a DBE firm in mm -hmm. order to meet the city's participation goals. But then that DBE firm then has to meet certain <laughs> criteria. <laughs> To meet certain well. criteria as well, and if you then in turn, if I'm a, con a subcontractor DBE, and then I then give my work to non-DBEs, does that really meet the requirement? Yeah. Um, so the new rules, does this tighten this up and tighten up enforcement? It does. It tightens it up, and it basically says that in order to be, in order to qualify as a DBE subcontractor, you have to perform at least 51 percent of the work yourself, and for work that you do subcontract out, only the work that you send to other certified DBEs is going to count towards that overall goal. Mm -hmm. And that's going to really um, tighten up some of those loopholes that had been in place that allowed situations like Woodward and Nomar to happen. Mm -hmm. So what does the city then have in place to enforce this, to police this, as it were? Essentially what they um, require these contractors to do is submit payroll records, submit all of the information on their subcontractors. If there's any sort of an ownership stake that the prime contractor has in a sub firm, you have to disclose that. You have to then say how much of the DBE work will actually be coming from DBE firms or as opposed to having a DBE that funnels its work to non-DBE firms. And the city set up mechanisms over time um, that should ensure that the paperwork will 
be there to find out if this is indeed going on. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll all be monitoring it to, to see if that works out the way that they have said it will. And so will the city actually be checking in on some of these jobs to see if the work is being done by those who are supposed to be doing it? Yeah, in their, um, in their policy that was passed um, this week, it says that at any point a contract can be subject to random visits, interviews with employees to see if the work is actually being done um, by DBE firms. Um, obviously the payroll records, um, they obviously have to go through the city um, and commit to hiring DBEs and commit to making an effort to find them. Um, and that's one of the key things in that policy that if you don't commit to making that effort, your contract could be rendered um, just, not responsive. Just quickly too, is this for any contract and every contract with the city or just for certain ones? Um, it's usually for the ones that are um, for public contracts over a certain amount, okay. so over 100,000 um, that come through the city and you have to then commit to meeting this overall 35% okay. goal. All righty, thanks a lot. Back over to Stephanie now and there was a meeting among political yes. strategists to do a post-mortem on the gubernatorial race and th I know they must have loved <laughs> sitting there talking about it and you must have loved sitting I in there did. listening to it. I should say it was at LSU, the mm -hmm. Manship School and excerpts of it from it will be on LPB's mm -hmm. um, Public Square show next week, so you can catch some of it. Two interesting panels, one with strategists from the four primary cam uh, campaigns, one with two super two people around super PACs, the pro David Vitter super PAC, a guy named Joel DeGrotto, who was a longtime aide, and the gumbo PAC, which was the pro John Bell Edwards super PAC, a guy named Trey Orso, who's a longtime Democratic mm -hmm. Party operative. And they really kind of told a lot of secrets, which was really interesting. Um, from the Super PAC panel, one thing that we found out from the, the pro Vitter group is they so wanted John Bell Edwards as their opponent, as opposed to one of the other Republicans, that if they thought he, he might not make the runoff, they were going to advertise to try to help boost him. Yeah. Really? They were, this was a Vitter PAC? This was a Vitter PAC. PAC. Now, they ended up not having to do that once they saw how strong he was, but it was something they talked about, they admitted, which is interesting. That's happened in a few other states. Um, hmm. The pro Edwards Super PAC, Gumbo Pack, these are the people who had those anybody but Vitter billboards early on. And they re, uh, Trey Orso really talked about this strategy of using those billboards, using social media to try to get at Vitter's invincibility, this idea that he couldn't be beaten and that if you were someone who was uncomfortable with David Vitter, you weren't alone, as he, mm -hmm. the way he put it, to start a conversation about that. And then we get to the runoff. Then we get to, you know, the primary happens. John Bell Edwards gets 40%. And, oh, and, and back to the primary, the other thing Joel DeGrotto for the Vitter Super PAC said, you know, his mission was really to make sure neither Scott Angel or Jay Darden emerged as the Republican alternative to Senator Vitter. So what he was doing was watching the polls really closely, and if one started to rise, he would hit him. If the other started to rise, he would hit him. <laughs> he called it whack-a-mole on a balance beam. <laughs> and of course, this is one of the things that really infuriated the other two Republicans, these in-party yeah. attacks. So then you get to the, the runoff, and there is that ad, which I think was the most effective ad of the whole I thought so um, too. campaign, and that was a gumbo pack ad. And, and that it ad was, was the ad was uh, Jay Darden and Scott Angel, uh, scenes from debates, mm -hmm. basically saying David Vitter is vicious. Lying he's a me. liar. He's lying <laughs> about me. He's you know a, st a stench will come over Louisiana if he's yeah. elected. I mean, really vicious stuff Their coming from other Republicans. Coming from the primary debate. Exactly. Yeah. Not and, cut for a commercial, but actually yes, said, but they said from their own lips. Yeah. And you know so. Trey Orser talked about the strategy behind this. He said, you know, their poll showed that they could probably get about half of the Vitter, the Angel and Darden voters. They wanted to hold on to that. They wanted mm -hmm. to keep feelings raw. So that's one of the reasons they ran that ad. They also wanted to make it make sure that they couldn't turn around and endorse Vitter, which I don't know that either would have, but it would have been very difficult to with this ad running. Well, obviously, I would um, guess the political... And I should say, the other thing is, like, a lot of Democratic money went into that gumbo pack ad to finance Republicans attacking Republicans. So it was kind of brilliant that way, too. Well, I guess there were some surprises that happened in this race for, for many, many folks. And I guess yeah. a race for the books? Is that what this was? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, Stephanie. Thanks, Errol. Over to you. We have it's, it's holiday season mm -hmm. time and uh, bowl games, football games. First of all, if voters knew how manipulated they are by political strategies exactly. and the attitude that political strategists have of them, that they would give up on democracy. Even if you were them would vote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's so good sometimes to see them wrong on, on this. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, yeah, uh, just quickly, uh, you know, we have this huge tradition in the United States of, about bowl games, which has exploded over the last decade or so. You know, the real purpose of bowl games isn't as much to declare championships as is to uh, increase Christmas time tourism in cities, which is always a downtime because usually you have very few conventions during Christmas time. And so that's why they started them way back when. Let's create a, a ball game to bring people here. I mean, going with the, the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl, which were the first, uh, the first two bowl games. Now New Orleans is lucky enough to have two bowl games. One's a, a second tier bowl game. It's called the New Orleans Bowl. It'll be played on December 19th this year at the Super Bowl. And it averages somewhere in the, the high 20s to 30,000 people each year, which is good because that's people who wouldn't be coming. For the last few years, we had, uh, we had several appearances by ULL out of Lafayette, and that was great. It was, it, it was a good regional draw. Uh, ULL will not be here this year, but it'll, it'll be uh, Louisiana Tech. And Louisiana Tech will, will be playing Arkansas State. And so it's two schools within driving range, but not so close to driving range that they wouldn't have to stay over yeah. and then overnight. Bowl. And then the Sugar Bowl, Bowl is, uh, is Ole Miss, which has always been, been a draw, and Oklahoma State. So we don't have the big super championship game, but I think we have two games with people who will come to the bowl game. Mm -hmm. And so we win where it counts the most in the economy. And where they can pretty easily get to New Orleans yeah, and have absolutely. a wonderful time yeah, over the sure, holidays. Sure. And we invite them all. All right, it's time to look mm -hmm. ahead. Errol, well, next year, you. everybody's going to be looking to the Senate race uh, to replace David Vitter. And the smart money right now is, looks like there's going to be maybe five to six Republicans running. But there's going to be every effort in the world made to contain it to one Democrat, which is kind of like using the, uh, the John Bell uh, mm -hmm. uh, Edwards strategy. A lot, a lot of negotiation that one Democrat's going to be. But look for, but look, look for a field of, of six serious Republicans and maybe one Democrat. Who do you think that Democrat might Don't be? Don't know. Okay. <laughs> Not a guess. All right. Okay. Gordon. Um, well, I, I think uh, 2016 is going to be the year that you're going to see the Advocates' new headquarters on uh, St. Charles <laughs> Avenue finally rise up um, over yeah. near uh, Lee right. Circle or whatever they're calling Under it the next year. Under the Robert E. Lee. Exactly. Or, or not. Right. And y'all have been waiting for this now how long? Oh, I've lost count. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll be moving in in 2016, Jessica. Well, we've got the Monuments decision next week. Um, we'll see the outcome of that um, finally. And we also have um, Woodward, which is the DBE, or the firm that was accused of funneling its contract values to non-DBEs, be in the World Trade Center deal. So there's a lot of close scrutiny on that to see if, to make sure that they do everything right this time and that they don't have a situation um, like the Iberville project. Iberville, that's what I was going to ask you what other project it was. All right, Jessica, thanks. Steph. Um, to piggyback on what Errol said, I think, you know, as we're looking at Louisiana in Congress, we lost Mary Landrieu, we're losing David Vitter now, um, we're probably going, we are losing two members of Congress, too, because two of them are running in that Senate mm -hmm. race, Charles Bustani and John Fleming. Again, the, it's been a problem these last few years. Louisiana really kind of keeps going to the back of the line in seniority, and you never know when that's going to matter, when you're really going to need something out of right. Congress. Okay, Steph. So, thanks. Thank you guys for being here, and want to thank you all for joining us. And of course, want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Thank you.